evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Augustina Beringer, and I am the Chief Medical Officer for Heart to Heart International. Uh, Heart to Heart International is a global humanitarian organization, and it focuses on improving access to healthcare. We have been in operation since 1992, and we are headquartered in Lenexa, Kansas, which is just outside of Kansas City. We respond to natural disasters all over the world by deploying volunteers to provide direct patient care to the affected populations, as well as supporting survivors and organizations with supplies and equipment. We do so uh, it greatly in part to our wonderful volunteers. Um, and in this particular case, we will be highlighting our disaster response volunteers. So tonight we'll have the opportunity to hear from three of our most experienced volunteers. We have Dr. Bob Gwynn, and we have registered nurses Kay Martin and Roger Harper. After the panelist discussion, we will have a question and answer session to address any questions that you, the audience, may have. So go ahead and type those questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will get to them after, um, after an initial discussion. All right, so we are going to get started. Panelists, our first question for you is, if you could each tell me, what made you first interested in volunteering and how many deployments have you been on? Why don't we start with you, Kay? Uh, hello. I, um, so probably about five years ago, I learned of Heart to Heart uh, through a family member. Um, it was my daughter. She knew I was interested in um, doing some type of volunteering. And it was at the time of Hurricane Harvey. And um, I applied and deployed and uh, it's uh, been a real worthy, worthwhile adventure on the deployments. And I have been deployed three times. Wonderful. And how about you, Bob? Tell us about your, uh, what made you interested and how many deployments have you been on? Um, I'm uh, a family doctor in Ohio and uh, have always been interested in emergency medicine. Um, and the opportunity to get involved with disaster medicine, I felt that that was something where I could really serve. I'm fairly, uh, it's, um, uh, I feel it's in my skill set. And uh, I've deployed three times uh, with Hurricane Harvey, Michael, and Dorian. Um, and uh, just have been uh, very fulfilling experiences. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Roger, last but not least, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm an ER nurse, and uh, volunteering is just sort of an extension of uh, of my personality. Uh, I've deployed three times, I think, with Heart to Heart. Total, uh, I also work with Team Rubicon, and I'm on a DMAT team. So over the years, since the late 90s, I've deployed 34, 35, 36 times, something like that. And um, oh. it's just... Uh, I don't know, it's an extension of the emergency room. Every deployment's different, um, but they're all alike where the need is present. And um, it's just something I enjoy doing. Get a lot of personal satisfaction out of it. Absolutely. So why don't we have each of you walk us through a typical day of your deployment experience? And again, we'll start with UK. Yes. Um, well, typically we finish the day um, with a huddle at night and kind of regroup. And sometimes we would get our assignments at night um, or know which maybe there would be different clinics set and we would all split up. So typically we would, you know, get up then in the morning, have our breakfast and we're off to a clinic or an outreach clinic, which is just kind of a mobile setup clinic. Um, and throughout the day, we could be traveling to two or three different spots, kind of how it was in the Bahamas. And, um, and sometimes that went in, into the evening hours uh, to get around to the, the different areas that we needed to get to. All right, Bob, what say you? Um, well, as Kay said, but uh, I found it's quite variable as to what type of uh, activity you do during the deployments. Uh, when Kay says a mobile outreach clinic, she didn't mention that that's the back of an SUV on a dirt road someplace. Um, 
it can be pretty primitive. Sometimes it's under, under uh, a tree, to be fair. <laughs> okay, that, that does make it nicer. <laughs> Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it can vary. Uh, in the Bahamas, it was extremely interesting. We uh, partnered with the uh, Department of Health, and two or three of us at a time would go out to uh, out outlying islands and ended up in fascinating places, assessing damage, assessing medical capability uh, and different out islands. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the job can be Anything uh, ended up working in the ER on Marsh in Marsh Harbor, um, and other times just uh, you know straight clinic work when the um, clinic staff had had to go home and take care of themselves and their families after uh, Hurricane Harvey. So it can be quite variable, and there's always paperwork in the evening um, if, and the uh, regrouping in the evening. Absolutely. Roger, what about a typical day for you? Well, it's usually up before the sun and uh, <laughs> try to uh, corral some breakfast as a group and then go into work. Um, I've ridden in pickup trucks, in the back of pickup trucks to work. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that, but uh, <laughs> um, the day is usually either a clinic or a, with, with clinic type patients for the most part, a few emergencies. Uh, but they're long days. They're usually hot, unair conditioned. And um, in the evening, you sort of gather um, for a, a quick meal before bedtime. So you don't get, a, I don't usually get a lot of reflection done during the day. Um, it's usually after the deployment when I kind of focus in on things, but uh, you got to be very flexible. Absolutely. And uh... I always feel like that is a bit of a trick question about a typical day because it feels like no day is uh, no two days are alike, right? <laughs> um, so something that we hear a lot from uh, new volunteers is, uh, what do I bring? What do I pack? How do I prepare? Now, Heart to Heart does supply a list, a packing list for for volunteers if they're being deployed. But in addition to that list. What are one or two items that you absolutely would not want to deploy without and any other packing tips you might have for future volunteers? Yeah, um, I'll go with two things. Uh, it, the list is pretty long and you end up sometimes just taking too much stuff, but a raincoat and a flashlight, a small flashlight. Um, and, and then just try and pack as light as possible because you may be... Um, you know, carrying your stuff a lot. And, uh, um, and so it just makes it easier. And um, maybe some, another thing would be the quick dry material in shirts, that, that kind of stuff, because you're um, having to wash your stuff out. Laundry your own stuff a lot of times. Absolutely. Bob will come to you. Yes. I um, I would agree in packing the light stuff that's easy to clean and and um, uh, and dry. Um, ended up washing a lot of clothes in the in the swimming pool that used to be uh, that wasn't anyway. Now it's full of sand, but there was enough water to wash in, and then you could dry it. And if it dried overnight, you were good to go. Um, the one thing I kind of got into was uh, taking some kind of sleep aid. Um, I I don't know if this is legal to say either, but um, um, you know, I haven't slept with 14 over the guys counter. in the room. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I call my doc and <laughs> get some Ambien. Um, but yeah, I haven't slept with 14 people in a room for a long, long time and, and sleep's important. So that's kind of one of the things that I, um, make it a point to, to have a access to. And then the other thing is, uh, deploying without power, um, electricity, um, I carry, you know, try and get a, um, um, uh, um, an extended battery for my phone, uh, for my iPad, so I can read. Uh, we have quite a few different uh, solar converters, but it's nice to have extra power at any at any moment, so you can you know read on your iPad. Or a lot of places set up cell fairly quickly, um, and so you know even you might have a cell service uh, where you are. So those are the three things that I would agree to. We'll go to Roger. 
All right. Um, bug spray is, is a big one for me. That it's sunscreen. Frequently you're out in the sun and it's hot, it's humid. Uh, so you can get sunburned really easy. A paperback for downtime in the evening, uh, if you've got light. Um, an iPad is always good or some kind of tablet thing for reading books. Um, something I can't go without is beef jerky. Just a little, and I tended to in the beginning years way overpack and the more I deploy, the lighter I get. And I realize I can do without a lot of stuff. Absolutely. I'll second the um, something to read because it's nice to, you know, distract your mind a little bit from a long day. And then to Bob's point, I can't live without earplugs on deployment because then I won't I won't sleep and you got to rest. Yep. And I agree. I just packed myself for a three to four week deployment to Papua New Guinea in like the tiniest carry on. I don't recognize myself. What have I become? All right, folks, the next question is, what is a particular moment or incident that has stuck with you from a deployment and what has it taught you? Okay. Um, I'm gonna refer back to the Bahamas, Avaco. Um, and we were kind of working one day with a Canadian team and it was three young nurses and a physician. And we were at um, the little Haitian community, the intersection. Those that have been there would are familiar with that. It was a rainy, rainy day. And um, we were seeing some patients on a porch. And this lady sat down first and she had a rag tied around her foot. And she had, um, she had stepped, it had to have been a pretty large nail. It was a nail puncture wound. And she had that wrapped with a, a dirty rag that she'd put salt on the wound and soak the rag in gasoline. We took that off. The wound was really, it was, it looked surprisingly well. And um, so my take from that is, you know, you have to be accepting and just non-judgmental. And they're, they're so wanting help and medical care, but yet they do with the best that they can and things work out usually. Absolutely. Bob, what about you? Well, well there have been a lot of moments. Um, uh, but prim primarily, um, uh, it's it's been the people I've met and experiences that we've shared, both with the people we've responded with and the people we've served. Um, to, to hear somebody describe dodging 200 mile an hour coconuts um, it gives me a whole new perspective on, on, on life. And as Kay says, you learn to be where people are. And, and that's, that's uh, it's just so humbling to do that. Um, Mr. I've been thinking about this question for a while and, and it's been quoted from Mr. Rogers that uh, in hard times, look for the helpers. Um, and to have been to places where, um, met three, three guys from some small hick town in, in North Carolina, sorry, anybody, North Carolina, who set up a water mission, uh, reverse osmosis well system. And, you know, just these guys who just come and, and help and you talk to them and they're, you know, we're all normal people. And um, it's just very humbling to meet people like that and to meet people who uh, the team Rubicon people who are just a kick and, to meet people who are serving and to meet people who've been affected by these disasters and aren't broken. I mean, they've got a spirit. Um, we went to a church in um, Marsh Harbor. Uh, one Sunday morning, we went to church before we did an outreach clinic. And it was probably one of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had. Um, it, it was uh, in, all in Creole. I didn't understand a word of it, but believe me, it got the message. So all of those are, are just wonderful of experiences that I've had through, through working with Heart to Heart. So. That's wonderful. Roger, and what about I, you? Know, I'm sorry, go well, ahead. I'm sorry. But I, I mean, I don't mean to say that it's all about me um, because it is a service. <laughs> we didn't get that message but, at all. <laughs> no, but it I've, didn't come I've come out of I've come out of these as so much a richer and I've gotten a lot out of these deployments. 
So I'm sorry, Roger. <laughs> Quite all right. So for me, I think the biggest takeaway is the smiles of, of little kids. You know, they're uh, very grateful um, just having you being present. Um, so that that's a big thing for me. It's just the smiles of, of grateful kids. I love that. That is wonderful. And I, I completely agree with all of you. We, we get as way more than we give. I was going to say oh, as yeah. much, but way more than, than we give. So um, it's, it's, I had the pleasure of serving with all three of you at different times. And um, the Bahamas was a common, a common one. And uh, it's, it's been wonderful, not just the relationships we make with the uh, people that we work with, but uh, as you said, you know, the, the lives that we touch, albeit fleetingly, uh, they touch us way more lastingly, I'm sure. Uh, so what parting words of advice would you provide to someone who's considering becoming a volunteer? I would say just um, be adaptable and just go with the flow. Um, each day is different and sometimes each hour is different. Uh, certainly what you may do in the morning isn't gonna work what you're gonna be doing in the afternoon. So it's just kind of a um, be flexible. Um, what works one day for an assignment may not work the next day, but um, everybody's there working together and um, trying to take care of the people as best they can. Wonderful words. And Bob, what would you say to potential volunteers? Um. I've, I've tried to, I think the thing that heart to heart brings that's so unique is the logistic support. Um, I've tried to volunteer other times and you kind of end up just showing up and saying, I'm pretty, I'm here to help, you know, what can I do? Whereas with heart to heart, it's really set up, you know, our, our, our team leader will generally go to the incident command system. Uh, they will come out with a assignment for that day, you know, in conjunction with what everybody else is doing uh, in the system, and you are really part of a con consolidated um, disaster response, as opposed to an individual cowboy in the middle of, you know, which may even not help as much. But so I think the logistic support um, and the organization just makes it a really uh, allows you to be very effective in what you do and when you deploy. Uh, that's great. I'm glad that it comes across because certainly our logistics people work very, very hard. And I think they're extremely yes. talented. Uh, and that Roger, makes the mission. I, yeah. It does. Absolutely. Right. Um, <laughs> Roger, what about you? Any, uh, any general words of advice? Well, on the DMAT teams, they, they, their one of their mottos is Semper Gumby, always flexible. Um, you know, you may go to work and start out in a clinic seeing, uh, doing med surge level work. 20 minutes later, it might be ICU and then switch to psychosocial with a bit of logistics thrown in. Um, you need fuel for the generators, your task to go find that somewhere. Um, and your day, you just have to be flexible throughout the day. You know, and it doesn't matter so much as what your specific job is in the real world. Um, as long as you're flexible, um, you have a lot of value and contribute a lot. I completely agree. Uh, we don't often hear the words, that's not my job when we, exactly. when we deploy. We certainly stick with our scope of practice, but um, we nobody seems to be too good to go fill up a generator or you know do a, other tasks. Um, so thank you for that. We do have a few questions from the audience. So if you guys don't mind, uh, we'll go through those. So Catherine wants to know, how does your employer work with you to, al to allow time off to deploy? Well, um, right now I, I, I am retired now, but when I started with Heart to Heart, I was still working. Um, they were, I, I, worked, I worked 43 years in a small hospital. Um, and so I worked ER and med surge. Um, I did take my own personal time. I mean, I took personal time, uh, but uh, they were very, they worked with me very well and were able to give me the time off that I requested. 
and also Lee says hello. Okay, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, all right, Bob. What about Hi, you? How did you make that work with uh, with your employer? Um, I took it mostly as PTO, uh, just as as vacation time, basically. Um, and what you find is your employer will work that. I mean, they will potentially, you know, use that. Uh, they, they may advertise that that our our employee, our nurse, our doc is someplace, and um, they, they they're pretty. At least my experience has always been very supportive from my employer. Roger, what kind of experience have you had from your employer? Because I know you've also deployed with DMAT, which, uh, which is a little different, um, as well as other organizations. Well, I, for the most part, I take uh, time off, but uh, most employers are very generous and they realize what you're doing is a really good thing. Uh, but they also use that uh, as a sort of a PR thing for their own, uh, their own business, their own hospital. Um, so they get something out of it as well. Um, but uh, with, with DMAT, I'm covered under the federal end of it, but, uh, uh, but I'm, I did eight, eight last year deployments. I've done four so far this year, wow. going to Papua New Guinea next week, something we're like that. We're going. <laughs> yeah, we're going. Um, but it's if you work with your employer, you let them know that uh, that you volunteer and uh, this is the type of thing that you're doing. Generally, they understand. I'll also give a shout out to very supportive coworkers who, yes. in my experience, yes. step up to take yes. your shifts so that you can go and do what you do. So yeah, it's it's I personally when I worked in the ER, our schedules were not super flexible, um, but when I moved to um, to a smaller practice, then it became easier to deploy. So I was a volunteer with Heart to Heart before I became employed by them. All right, we have another question from the audience. Um, oh, sorry, I'm scrolling way down. Uh, what type of patients do you typically see on deployment? Um, well, I would say a lot of patients typically that have lost their medicine. So mm -hmm. if they're on blood pressure medicine, if they're diabetic, they've lost their medicine and they come in for help with getting their medicine. Um, but there's wounds, um, lacerations, um, dehydration, you know, starting IVs, rehyd mm -hmm. rehydrating people, um, that sort of thing, I'd say. Bob, what about you? I would agree that it's mostly primary care um, and mostly um, replacing lost medicine. There is a ton of insulin and metformin in the Gulf of Mexico uh, or the Caribbean. I will swear to that. Um, and, it, you know, it might be an instance where the patient, somebody's been on lisinopril and all we have in the clinic is 3,000 pills of amlodipine. You know, so you will, you know, sometimes be mixing and matching uh, different medications. Um, and sometimes there's the occasional emergency walks in. Uh, I, you know, we had a broken arm at the, <clears throat> a traumatic broken arm at the clinic just walked in. Um, I ended up, you know, as I say, in the ER one night intubating somebody. Um, uh, but typically we're a low acuity um, uh, primary care. And I think that that is probably one of the, um, some, not surprises, but that, that we really are um, almost a, a safety net clinic when we go to these areas. Um, Absolutely. It's interesting, it's challenging. <laughs> it also depends a lot um, what stage of the disaster we come in, right? If we're there yes. 24 hours after the disaster versus two weeks after the disaster, we're gonna see different types of patients. Uh, but I agree with you that there is a misconception that we're rappelling down from helicopters and, you know, doing traumatic amputations on the field. And there's not really that, that much of that. I have yet to rappel. <laughs> Roger, what about you? I agree. Mostly it's uh, you initially you see people that uh, uh, their houses have been destroyed. They've left their medicines behind. They need refills um, or if the pharmacies aren't available. If we have medicines, we can either give them the same thing that they're on or substitute to get them through. Um, a little bit further on, maybe 
you also see at the same time in medications, you see wounds. And then further down the line, a couple of weeks into it, you may see GI complaints from bad water. And um, basically that's it. It's, it's mostly yeah. clinic work. Great. We do, do have a question in the chat about mental health uh, component um, to the care we provide. What, uh, what mental health needs have you seen? And then what do we do about it? Well, typically I'm gonna refer, I'll ref, even it with after Harvey in Texas and especially the Bahamas, people just wanna talk and they want to tell their story. And, um, a lot of it is being a good listener. And um, so I, I can't say that I was hand in hand in finding specific psychiatric care, um, but you know, from checking the patient in as the nurse and then you know, listening to them and then getting them to the provider. And a lot of times the provider is is listening, or well, they are, they're listening and uh, counseling that patient also. And I'll say that, um, you know, while we don't pretend to be psychologists or psychiatrists, mm -hmm. nor do we have really the uh, capacity to implement long-term therapy, for example, um, we do train all our volunteers in psychological first aid to uh, at the very least avoid doing harm, which sometimes can happen if we ask the wrong questions or if we're insensitive or untrained in um, talking to people who have recently experienced trauma. Uh, Bob, what have you found uh, as far as mental health? Well, I would really echo what Kay said, um, the ability to talk, the ability to listen, empathize with paid people. Um, and there is a, a strong need for that. Uh, we carry in our kits um, very limited psych medications. I think we, we have Vistarel, uh, and I think we have some Seroquel now too, low-dose Seroquel. Um, but mostly it's you know, situational anxiety that people can you know, work through with some empathetic listening. Uh, we, interestingly, we did run into some, some substance um, uh, issues in uh, Florida with Hurricane Michael. Uh, a lot of people got their uh, opiate um, distribution center or networks disrupted. Um, and that came, made some interesting times also. Um, and um, so again, it just, it just depends on where you are and um, um, what, what happens. So what, and also probably what stage you're at also in the, in the response. But Absolutely. anything anything can happen. Mm -hmm. Roger, what about you? What have you observed? Well, I, I think there's a, a big need for being a good listener. Um, try to understand what the person's been through. Um, but listening is, is about the best that, uh, given some situations where the infrastructure is totally gone, a lot of the people have evacuated, there's no clinical resources to refer people to that need acute intervention, just being a listener. And hopefully there's relatives available or close friends that you can get these, these individuals talking with. Absolutely. Um, and another question we see is what keeps you coming back? Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> The people that you're caring for, the patients, um, what keeps me coming back is the heart to heart staff and just the awesome people that you meet and you get to work with on these deployments. Um, it's I, the logistic people are awesome to work with. I, I don't, we, we couldn't do it without them. And, um, and I think heart to heart has done a good job as far as training, um, making sure the volunteers get the training. Um, it, I got the, I was able to go through the hands-on where we physically met, that was pre-COVID. Um, but there, the organization is working hard now to 
uh, do that training online. And it, I, I found it very beneficial. Wonderful. Bob, what about you? What keeps you coming back to Heart to Heart? Um, I would say pretty much the same things. Is, is it's the people you meet in the disaster, the people you work with in the response, um, and just the, uh, the positive, it, it's a real positive chance to, to serve and, and an opportunity that you don't get very often in life to really do significant work and um, to be um, you know, involved in something this big and this significant. So I pretty much agree with everything Kay said. It's, it's just a really fulfilling way to work and, and a situation to work in. And Roger, what about you? You actually have a lot of experience with different organizations, but you uh, you continue to volunteer with us as well. So Heart to Heart yeah. must be doing something right. Yes, ma'am. It's the camaraderie and esprit de corps of your coworkers. Um, you bond very quickly on a deployment and uh, you can see someone that you deployed with several years ago on, the, on a subsequent deployment and you instantly rekindle that, that relationship. Um, so, and you meet new people all the time and they bring all their experiences with them. So I really enjoy that aspect of it. Wonderful. We're so glad to, uh, to have you all continue to come back. Um, oh, this is a great question. What was the biggest challenge you have faced while deployed? Uh, the biggest challenge? Um, in, uh, so Bahamas for me, um, it was maybe a couple weeks after the disaster that I, uh, went there and it, it was still kind of challenging just the travel experience, uh, getting through NASA, um, and I was with one of the providers and then she got held up because she was hand carrying some equipment, uh, some supplies. Uh, so it's just, you just kind of have to, once again, go with the flow, know where you're supposed to be headed and, and um, make sure you have a guardian angel on your shoulder. And just to tell the audience that, that the deployment we did in the Bahamas, we were not in the main island uh, of Nassau, which was very, um, pretty unaffected by Hurricane Dorian. We were in this small island of Abaco that is uh, sparsely populated to begin with. And then of course it was very, very hard hit. So as Kay referenced, just getting there involved a lot of uh, support from our logistics uh, team. Bob, what about you? What was the biggest challenge that you have faced while deployed? Um, there were a couple things. Um, one was going to a completely different uh, social system. Um, Whereas when I said, when we went out to the different uh, out islands, the Bahamas, um, there was a system where they would put um, um, armbands on the non-resident um, uh, islanders, mostly people of color. And that that armband was what determined where you could go. And, you know, to me coming from the States, this is like, holy crud, this is, you know, a thousand years ago. Um, so, you know, seeing things like that um, were hard. Um, seeing people, you know, who just have been wiped out, uh, you know, their home is a pile of sticks uh, is tough. And you, I mean, you can't, you know, help everybody make everything right. You can do what you can within your limits. Um, and then coming back was interesting. And as um, Augustine has said, the um, um, Nassau was relatively unaffected. So we, we come back smelling like three day old dogs, um, wet dogs. And, um, and then everybody in, in that, the Nassau airports going to the resorts and, and it's like, wow, I just stepped into a different world and I'm back <laughs> again. And this is, this was, <laughs> this was weird. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think all of it good and educational, but, but some of it a bit of a shock. Reentry can definitely be a bit of culture shock. Yeah. Roger, what about you? Uh, probably the most difficult deployment that I've been on is uh, Haiti in 2010. Um, seeing entire populations uh, sleeping on a golf course in tents made out of uh, bed sheets. 
Um, that was, uh, you know, and you, you, you see the population sleeping there, 10, 12,000 people, and you look to the right and to the left and you see totally destroyed homes. That's kind of impactful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for, I'll, I'll add that I think the biggest challenge I faced was also in Haiti, and this was not with Heart to Heart, but um, it was challenging because I didn't feel safe. Um, that particular deployment with a different organization didn't make me feel safe. And that's something that we tend to take for granted, right? Feeling safe. So um, I have to say that in all my deployments with Heart to Heart, I've never experienced feeling um, personally unsafe. So we'll hopefully keep that trend up. Um, okay, we have another question from the audience. Uh, do you have days off while you're on deployment or do you work most of the time? Well, you work most every day, um, but there is downtime. And um, in Texas after Harvey, um, we, we did get a day off. Um, the Bahamas, we worked every day, but um, once again, the camaraderie keeps you going. And um, plus in the Bahamas, I found it very interesting all the different organizations there. And, and if you had downtime, it's very interesting to, to maybe talk to the water mission people. Very interesting what they do. Or um, just observe the, um, the world, world kitchen bringing in the food and that kind of stuff. So um, it, it's not that we're go, go, go. They are long, stressful days, but we do have downtime. And once again, that camaraderie I think keeps us going. Absolutely. And Bob, what, what have you experienced as far as downtime? Um, most of the ones I want, you know, usually after about five, six days on a Sunday, um, Sunday was kind of the domestic day. We cleaned up the, cleaned up where we were staying, you know, um, and then uh, maybe did a little, a light clinic thing and then went out to the blue hole in, um, in uh, on Abaco, which is this wonderful freshwater pool in the middle of nowhere, and uh, then did a little swimming. And um, so there, there are there are times to relax. And uh, as Kay said, meeting people from other um, other organizations is 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 just worth the time too. I mean, uh, Team Rubicon was there with the Water Mission people. World Central Kitchen is just a phenomenal Impressive. group. These people they fly. Um, hot meals all over the island. They have a helicopter, they deploy a helicopter and they'll fly hot meals to the, the victims, to, to, to the relief organizations. And it's just an amazing group. Uh, and so that, that was interesting too, is just talking to other people that you deploy with. So there, there's, it's after about 10 days that, yeah, I was starting to get kind of tired, but it, there's enough break time that you don't over, don't burn out, uh, I didn't think. And Roger, what has your experience been like? Well, with most uh, agencies that I deploy with, uh, you work seven days a week, but you do get a few hours off here and there um, to do laundry. Um, maybe you're making a food run, you get away from patients for two hours, three hours, whatever it might be. But if you wind up doing your own laundry, you're usually doing three or four other people's laundry as well. <laughs> so, but it's a break, it's something different. <laughs> I don't know that I've heard laundry <laughs> referred to as a downtime very often, but now yeah, I know who to go. go to. There you go. <laughs> and I'll say that our team leads are extremely understanding. You know, if we have a long deployment, there's going to be some built in time off. But even if it's a shorter deployment, if you're feeling really stressed out and burnt out or you're not feeling great or whatever, we're not gonna crack the whip and get you to, uh, to work. Um, but yes, for the most part, we work every day that we're there because we're there relatively short times. All right, folks, let's wrap it up with, uh, oh, we have a comment actually that I'd like to read from Lee, who's also a previous volunteer. Um, she said it was helpful to bring a diary by writing things down at the end of the day, it helped decompress. And also, great point, a headlamp is very helpful because we don't usually have electricity. So thank you for that, Lee. And uh, we'll wrap up with our last question of the evening, which is what 
was your favorite deployment, if any, and why? Um, I would say the Bahamas was for me uh, because uh, it was a quicker response right after the disaster. Um, it, it was just a whole new experience. Um, and once again, just seeing the workings of some of these other organizations was, was um, uh, very beneficial and uh, a real a highlight of the trip. What about Bob? What, what has your been, yours been? I, I think um, the, the Dorian response to the Bahamas was also, um, it was probably the greatest need of anything I'd seen and the most widespread uh, devastation. And so there was quite a bit of opportunity to do, um, to do work there. Uh, and it was interesting to meet the uh, other communities, the other helpers that had come. So it was uh, extremely interesting and ex extremely fulfilling uh, to work there. Thank you. And Roger, what about uh, of your many deployments across the board with many organizations? What, which one did you really enjoy the most? Uh, for me, it was Puerto Rico with Heart to Heart after Hurricane Maria. We had, uh, we had a very unusual way of getting to Puerto Rico, number one. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we had to take a cruise ship out of uh, Florida to Puerto Rico. The airport was down. Um, so that kind of started it off on, on one note and uh, just the group that I was with was really spectacular. Um, and we got to go to a, a number of remote villages that people were so appreciative. And uh, so the, uh, Puerto Rico stands out for me. Wonderful. And I'll say that that was an empty cruise ship, just to clarify the cruise it industry. Was was uh, right, <laughs> the cruise ships were not going anywhere because of the storm, so they graciously gave us a ride. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists and to all the participants joining us tonight. Uh, we hope this has been an informative experience. And if it, we have gotten you excited about volunteering, uh, you can go to our website, which you can see on the screen. It's hearttoheart.org slash volunteer. And you can fill out an application. Make sure to um, make it for the disaster response team because we do have some other um, uh, volunteers that do stuff in headquarters. Um, and then if you have any questions, there's contact information on the website as well. So thank you again all so much for joining us and have a wonderful night.